These Kia and Hyundai engines love to fail. Today we're going to be tearing down this 2013 Kia Optima engine with only 130,000 kilometers on it to see just what happened. I mean, I can already tell, I can barely turn this engine over. It is pretty seized up. Now this engine was co-developed with the Chrysler World engine and Mitsubishi has also got a version of it. So you'll see it's very similar in terms of we got a plastic valve cover, coil and plug ignition, direct injection, which was actually the subject of a recall because it could cause fires. And it also causes carbon buildup in the intake, as we all know. You've got the accessories up at the front here, alternator AC compressor, aluminum block, aluminum head, and the oil cooler down below. Now this is a naturally aspirated 2.4, but if you had a turbocharger, it would be located at the back here, right up against the firewall. You've got the water pump with a coolant crossover that comes with this big plastic contraption of a coolant manifold. All right, I'm going to start by taking off some of the accessories. I'm going to remove this belt. Thanks to a seized engine, I can easily get the crank bolt out of here. I'll remove this alternator bolt. Let's get the AC compressor off. Anybody want an AC compressor or an alternator? That bearing doesn't sound too happy. I'm going to get this engine mount bracket off. You can hear there's coolant inside. I don't want to make mess just yet. The water pump pulley off. Next I'm going to turn my attention to the top of the engine where we have this direct injection pump. I have to first remove this line here. This is the subject of a recall where it could leak and cause a fire. So make sure you get that done. You'd rather your engine replaced under warranty than by insurance. And I'll take this line off at the bottom here. It's such that you have to remove this line in order to do a valve cover gasket job because the gasoline direct injection pump sits on top of the valve cover. This line out of the way. All right, the pump itself is held on by two tens. That's nasty. You can see the inside of the valve cover looks really crusty. Essentially, you've got a giant spring with a lobe that's going to push up and down. That's going to bring the low pressure fuel coming from the tank here, pressurize it to many thousands of RPM, and then push it down into the cylinders directly here. Let's get the coils off. Next up, we're going to remove the valve cover. A bunch of tanks going all the way around. Oh, no. Oh no, this one's sludged. And here we have a look under the valve cover. You can see there's a lot of sludge being built up underneath here, which is not good. That means it definitely followed the manufacturer's oil change interval of 7,000 to 12,000 miles, which is way too long for an engine like this, especially a gasoline direct injection engine. And the sludge is gonna tend to build up and clog things. And you can see under the valve cover, things are absolutely black, tarnished. There's sludge buildup everywhere. This engine could have definitely benefited from more frequent and premium oil changes, as well as run some good cleaner through here. Look at that. This stuff's just building up everywhere and it's just waiting to clog an oil passage. There's a mounting post here. These are 12s, by the way. And there's a mounting post at the top here for the direct injection pump. And there you can see the cam lobe, which is what's going to move up and down against this special cam over here for the direct injection pump. Peel off that crispy valve cover gasket. I'm going to switch sides here and go back down to the timing cover. I got to remove all these brackets first. Should be able to remove this tensioner assembly now. And at the bottom, where the oil pan is, we have this bracket for the AC compressor. Alright, the timing cover is held on by a bunch of 12s. Now I'm going to remove the 10s. Alright, time to find out if we've missed any bolts. So here's a look at the timing cover itself. Very nasty on the inside, but the only thing I like is that there's no oil galleys or oil pump attached here. It's just a top cover. And here we have a good look at the timing chain setup for this Hyundai Theta 2 engine. We got the exhaust and intake camshaft. Both have variable valve timing with their solenoids respectively on the sides. We have plastic timing chain guides, which I don't like, but that goes down to a single crankshaft. At the bottom here, we have an initial timing chain that goes down to the oil pump with its own oil control tension. I'm gonna knock off these cams. So even with all the accessories off, this engine does not want to roll over. It's so tight, you can barely get it to roll over. It was so difficult to get those torque converter bolts off. The good thing about having a seized up engine though, it's really easy to get your crank bolt loose. All right, so let's take off some of these components here, starting with the timing chain tensioner. That's an oil control tensioner. And we'll get this side off. Plastic, there's no metal backing or anything. It does look like there's two grooves kind of worn into it. And we'll get this return slide off. This one's just equally as worn. Get this chain off. And we'll get these guys off. Pull off these cams. Now if you want to learn more about how variable valve timing gears work, check out my video linked above. Next I'm going to remove the camshafts from the top. Okay, let's get these caps off. Check out some of the grooving on these camshaft bearings. That indicates there was probably a lack of oil at some point. 
and I'll remove the intake and the exhaust camshaft. And if you look closely, the bearing surfaces are also kind of scratched up too. Like I have two gloves on and I can feel that. Now Hyundai uses a very simple cam on bucket design. So essentially the camshaft acts directly on the bucket. There's no roller arms or rocker arms or hydraulic lifters or anything to worry about. But periodically you're going to have to shim up this bucket in order to do a valve adjustment. Now if you look closely, you'll see the tips of these cams are nice and clean. But if you roll them over, you'll see the back here is really tarnished like the rest of the engine. And that tells me this needed a cam adjustment as bucket here wasn't doing its job of contacting the camshaft all the time and there was a gap between here. This design is also surprisingly similar to what Toyota used to use in the mid 2000s. Now it's time to get a direct injection rail off. These are a 12 mil bolt. Just so you guys know, you see how rusty this hardware is? I'm not going to keep this. Usually Toyota and Honda fasteners are the best and I usually keep those. But this is probably on the same level as Subaru. First, oh my goodness, that's a lot of gas. I could have traveled to New York with that. Okay, so three of the injectors stayed inside. This is what the direct injector looks like. Now you got to bring high pressure fuel inside of here from that pump and push it into the combustion chamber directly like where the spark plug is. And that gives you optimal combustion, more performance and less emission. But of course that would be at the expense of all this carbon that's built up inside of the intake. Later we'll take the valves off and we'll actually see how much carbon is behind them. You can see I've been avoiding the cooling system and that's because I'm sure there's a lot of coolant in there. It's going to make mess. The oil cooler is the lowest point here. So we're going to start by taking off these hoses and spill some coolant on my ground. All right, it's not too bad yet. I guess we'll see when we get the rest of it off. Get this thermostat off. All right, inside of here we have the thermostat. And you can see this is a traditional style thermostat, nice metal frame, at least it's replaceable and not one piece. I don't like the use of plastic in the cooling system because coolant gets very hot and over time it's going to cause the plastic to expand and contract and eventually crack and cause a leak. Now this entire manifold is actually made of plastic, which is even worse. There's the coolant crossover pipe over here, surprisingly made of metal. See that's the other thing, you can't even pry against plastic. I'm going to move this bracket out of the way. Looks like that holds some sensors and wires up here. Alright, what's with Hyundai and using 13? I thought the Japanese don't use 13s. Come off. Yay, it comes off the head. I'm gonna remove this crank position sensor very carefully so I can get the rest of this stuff off. Be sure not to damage it. By the way, that's where the coolant temperature sensor hangs out. Might as well knock the water pump off while we're at it. I got a pan down there, don't worry. Now the water pump itself, it's not exactly D-shaped, but it does have metal impellers. The housing's made of metal. That's a pretty solid design. Now I really like how Hyundai's put these hooks in. Makes it real convenient for me to move the engine around, but they really put this there because they've been eating warranty on these engines and it's actually worth it for them to put it so that their technicians can pull it out a lot faster. Now the head bolts on these are supposed to be an M12 triple square, but there's so much sludge inside of the socket I don't want to strip it, so I'm going to come in here with a pick and remove all the sludge from these head bolts over here. And then I'm going to be ingesting brake cleaner for the next half an hour, trying to get it all clean so I don't strip anything. I'm going to crack these head bolts loose now. All right, taking a look under the head. Now, first of all, I don't notice any pistons that are out of the place or they don't have any holes or cracks in them. All the pistons are currently present. Looking at the head gasket here, I don't see any breaches between the cylinders and there's no evidence of coolant in the oil. Interesting to note, we have an open block design here where we have coolant flowing all around the cylinders, which is great for cooling. And especially this being a non-turbocharged, lower stress engine, that's fine. You don't really need the reinforcements in between. By the way, there was plenty of oil in this engine, so it's not like I got it with really, really low oil. One thing I forgot to take off was this water pump housing. These are just a bunch of 12s that hold it onto the block. Here we have a stamped steel lower oil pan, which is nice and old school. Now there's two 12.12 millimeter bolts that hold the lower oil pan to the upper oil pan and to the block. I'm gonna remove those. These long ones. Oh no. Well, the bottom of the engine isn't any better than the top. Take a look at all the crust and sludge that's inside of here. This is nasty. Definitely indicates that uh, someone has not been changing the oil, at least frequently enough. I know manufacturers suggested oil change intervals are not enough. And if you look closely enough, you'll actually see some sparkles in there. So I'm pretty sure some bearing has been chewed up. Okay, we probably know why Kia engines fail, but I think this particular one failed because the owner, being a typical Kia owner, doesn't care for their car. 
just didn't change the oil on time. That's why all this carbon is built up all around these non-moving parts here. And it's just so sticky. And I'm pretty sure some of this is probably clogged one of the oil arteries causing a connecting rod bearing to spin or something. Now this part here is called the balance shaft to prevent vibrations. But on this side here, we have the oil pump and there's a pickup tube here, which is actually surprisingly clean. Now this chain uses a strange looking nut, which I have never seen before. So we'll just try to get all the other components off. This is the tensioner. So you can see back there that little hole is where the oil is going to go in to give this chain tension. Typically a chain driven oil pump just has a spring tensioner. It's interesting that they've put an oil tensioner in there. Check out those grooves that the chain wore into this tensioner slide. We got this tensioner slide off. This one doesn't have as much wear. So I'm not going to show you. I can't even tell what kind of bolts these are so I'm going to spray them down and coming with what's left of my daughter's pants in my last video. It looks rounded to me. I don't know if I can even get a socket on that. There's so much carbon on it. All right, so I'm going to try a 12.12 millimeter socket on these. Okay, I'm going to break these free with a breaker bar. Come off. Stinks in here when you crack these free. Right, let's pull this out. You can see these front ones here actually went into the block, whereas these little guys just hold it on to the uh, lower oil pan there. For anybody wondering, this is where the dipstick tip ends and this is the oil pickup. So you got this much here of leeway in terms of starving your engine of oil if there's nothing on the dipstick. Wow, look how sludgy those bolts are. Pry this off. There's your balance shaft and oil pump assembly. This oil cooler is just staring at me, so let's take that off next. On oil filter, wow, that looks terrible. Anybody could have just opened the oil filter and seen that and rendered this engine jump. To get the oil cooler off, it's a 12 millimeter hex. And this should come off here. Coolant in, coolant out, and oil in and oil out. Now the filter housing is held on by 12 millimeters. Very simple, oil in, oil out, straight to the filter. Next, we're gonna get the lower oil pan off. Now, not only is it kind of an oil pan, but it's a ladder frame structure that kind of strengthens up the bottom end, especially on the turbocharged engines, that's pretty important. However, with the rate that these are blowing, nothing's really important at this time. So these are 12 millimeter 12 point. All right, time to see if we've missed any bolts. Struggling here because I forgot to take out the dipstick from the block. Now we can take off this upper oil pan. Kind of forms part of a windage tray, but also that ladder frame designed to strengthen things up. We've got oil return galleys over here. So we're barely down to the block and the crank with the pistons inside, and I still can't get this thing to rotate. I think I can get all the connecting rod bolts out. So we've stripped everything down to the bottom here, and this is basically where all these engines fail. We're gonna remove the connecting rod caps and see what's up. These are 10 millimeter, 12 point. All right, let's remove the last connecting rod here. Got my brother's old t-shirt. I'm gonna wipe this off so we can see the damage to the bearing. Yeah, that's pretty rough. All right, so these connecting rod and pistons don't even wanna get pushed down their bore. That one can go. Then, you know what? Let's get the crank out of here first. We'll remove this rear main seal. It's crustier than your grandma's foot. Now these connecting rod caps are just two bolts. They're not cross bolted. They're not four bolts, which is kind of sad. Some other V6 engines cross bolt them and put multiple bolts in there to keep it nice and strong. Zip these off. Gotta use some encouragement. I'm going to take the crankshaft out. Now I'm going to see if we can push these pistons out of here. Right in the oil. And finally, I can lift the block off the stem. Now that we've got the engine all taken apart, let's take a closer look at some of the components, starting here with the piston head, which is literally trolling you with this smiley face, the two eyes, and this big smile. Now these divots on top here are typical of gasoline direct injection engines, so they can control the combustion as this piston is going down. Now looking at the oil rings here, you can see that they're pretty much clogged up, and that's because this is a modern engine that uses low tension oil rings which are very small and don't allow too much oil to return back down into here, causing the engine to burn oil. And typical Kia and Hyundai owners don't check their oil, and when you run these low in oil, it's gonna damage the bottom end. Speaking of the bottom end, here you can see the connecting rod bearings. These are absolutely roasted. They've worn through the coating and gone straight down to the kind of copper surface underneath. A couple of them here even have burn marks. They're very rough. I can actually feel the surface here through my brother's old toothbrush. Now this is likely the reason why the engine didn't turn over because you have eight of these bearings that are pretty much seizing up against the crankshaft and don't want it to turn. And this is all due to lack of lubrication. I'm actually surprised that none of these connecting rods spun around on each other and the engine just chose to seize up 
as opposed to actually having engine knock where you have a missing bearing completely. It didn't chew it up. Now as to why these engines fail so often, especially the connecting rods, is because due to a manufacturing defect in this engine, they left debris inside of it, and that debris over time is gonna clog up oil passages, and it's gonna starve these bearings especially of oil, causing them to seize up. Now could you just slap some bearings in here and call it a day? Yeah, probably could, but remember you got all that debris floating around in the engine. It's just gonna come back and start eating away at this bearing again. Usually main bearings actually get oil first and connecting rod bearings get damaged first because they're further away in the oil stream. But to see these actually chewed up, that means that this engine had a pretty bad lubrication error. Check this out. Even on the block here, we have the thrust washer and even that's all scored up and damaged. Looking at the oil lubrication system of this engine, we have that giant oil pump mechanism that sits here. That's gonna suck oil in through here, send it out to the filter at the side here to get filtered out and cooled off and then sent back into the engine and that filter door is then going to be sent up through this hole into the block. That oil is then going to be sent in through this galley over here down into the main oil galley that runs along the length of the block where you can see these oil sprayers tap off of it to lubricate the cylinder walls with oil. Now the main crankshaft bearings are also going to tap off of it and that's also going to lubricate those connecting rod bearings. Now the crankshaft on these are a pretty sturdy and hefty piece. You can see the oil is going to enter the main bearing over here and then there's a cross drill that goes over to the connecting rod. And that's where you can see there's a lot of damage on here. That indicates that this was either run low on oil or run with debris through the oil. I mean, for a 2.4 naturally aspirated engine, this, this thing seems pretty solid. We've also got a pressed on gear over here for the trigger wheel for the crank position sensor. Let's take a look at this oil pump and balance shaft assembly. Essentially, we've got oil sucked in through this pickup tube over here. It's then gonna be sent into the upper oil pan through this hole over here. This here's where the chain's gonna connect to, and it has to be timed because we do have a balance shaft assembly on this side here, so let's take this apart. Long bolts. This is an E22 socket. So it is reverse threaded. I don't know why they'd use E Torx. Come on, Hyundai. Well, it looks like this piece comes out. This is the gear. Just so much sludge in here. It's so hard to see where things are. Essentially, that input shaft is going to spin this counter shaft over here, but it's also going to spin the oil pump, which was inside of here located with these gears. All right, so it turns out once you pop the screen off, there's a hidden 10 millimeter bolt. There we go. Now I can pop everything open. Looks like this had a pressed on gear. Taking a look inside of this oil pump, it's actually pretty interesting. There's two oil pumps. Essentially, you've got two gears here, one on this layer and then one on this layer that create oil flow. And then, of course, we have these balance shafts. Now, integrated in the housing here is a giant spring. That's your oil pressure regulator. Now, the balance shafts themselves have these weights on them, and these are going to be timed according to the crankshaft and they eliminate secondary forces coming from the crankshaft, which cause vibration. Now moving back over to the block, we've got the main oil galley here that tees off to go to the timing chain tensioner. It also tees off at the top here to go to lubricate the engine head. So let's go look at that next. Now underneath the engine head, very typical gasoline direct injection, got a lot of crust under here. This here is where the direct injector comes in through here, and this is the spark plug. You can see the cylinder sort of has a V shape to it. Here's where the oil galley sends oil up into the head for lubrication. Now we already saw how sludged up this engine is at the top so I'm going to take off some of these intake valves. I'm just going to use my valve compression tool here. Pull out these valves. Now the intake valves on this engine is not too bad. Usually carbon would start to build up here. There's only a very thin layer of crust. Remember this car only had 130 something thousand kilometers on it. Now this engine does not have EGR so that helps. It's really just a PCV system that's depositing it on here. And because it's direct injection over here, you don't have any gasoline flowing in the ports behind here to clean this off. But if you do have clogged valves, typical symptoms are going to be a misfire because you're starting to restrict the amount of air going into the engine. Honestly, even the ports inside of here feel kind of crusty so this could have benefited from a good cleaning. It's not like the rest of the inside of the engine is any better. Now while we can attribute this engine's failure due to clear lack of maintenance, these things happen all the time with many of these engines even after they've been replaced under the lawsuit or the warranty. Lubrication failures are happening left and right and if you do have one of these engines make sure you top off the oil and change it frequently so if any debris is going through there it can get flushed out. Now if you do experience any engine failures like this I recommend saving up for an LS swap or a Tesla motor swap because that would be cool on your Kia Optima.